Perdone, Lionel, ma c'è anche il canale in spagnolo? No, no, l'assistente di Jetsumo parla in spagnolo. Ah, ho capito. Ok. Ok. Venerable Jetsuma, uh, Lionel, can you put her as a main speaker on the screen? Okay. Venerable Jetsuma, we are very, very honored. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. But uh, no, the, the microphone, you should turn on the microphone there. Maybe Lionel, you add. Okay. Thank you, Jetsuma. Venerable Jetsuma, we are very, very honored to have you here. We have a, this is a very small center called Xinjiang Ritu and is uh, not too far from Rome in the countryside in an area that is historically full of uh, um, Christian monasteries and also caves with saints meditated there. So it's very holy area. And uh, we are so honored because you are an inspiration and an example for us for, because the retreat, the long retreat of 12 years that you made, I, I, I don't think any other Westerner has ever done what you did. And, uh, and we are lazy practitioner, try to practice with, with incredible laziness and, and you are an incredible example. Thank you so much and inspiration. By the way, I want to tell you that in 1970, I went to Lahul and I climbed up to your monastery before you enter into the 12 years retreat. And at that day, you were actually writing a text, copying a Tibetan text for an albine monk who couldn't, didn't have glasses and couldn't actually read the small letters. So you were writing big letters oh, yeah. and I met you I'm and I was sure. only 23 years old. And this was about, about almost, uh, yeah, 52 years ago. Can you imagine? So now we are still here. And I'm so honored to be able to do this presentation to you that definitely we must have some coming connection without any doubt, right? So we have 12 questions and I will, you know, there are actually two, two channels of translation besides our, um, you know, channel that uh, is English. And the other two are Italian and German, and they can choose their translation channel by right by clicking on inter interpretation down below uh, in the Zoom, uh, you know, screen. Okay. So having said that, I will um, now, you know, read the first question. Dear Jetsuma, what is the way to develop enthusiastic effort in the Dharma practice? Well, I mean, I, I feel, can we have, so I can see myself too a little bit. Um, that, uh, you know, we are enthusiastic when we enjoy doing something, right? If we, if we enjoy it, then enthusiasm naturally comes. It's not any, effort really we we just flow along because we're happy doing something so of course the traditional uh, approach is is to recognize the rarity of obtaining a human body um and a human birth and meeting with the dharma and having the opportunity to practice the dharma so for those of, who actually believe in in rebirth, we can recognize how, even if you don't believe in rebirth, you can think, you know, in this world, people are so, there's so much trouble, there's so much suffering, there's so much difficulties in people's lives, and everybody wants to be happy. And they all assume that happiness lies outside of themselves. And so, to my mind, the thing is that we, 
we recognize that our chance for genuine happiness and peace doesn't lie outside, it lies inside. The, the whole point is our attitude in our mind. And the Dharma is such an incredible method for learning how to transform the mind and to take a disturbed and distracted mind and make it into a well-tamed, happy mind. So the Dharma is the perfect way to how to tame our monkey mind. And by practicing, we can see that there is a change. I mean, just today I met a woman who had written to me previously, an Indian lady, so many problems, so many difficulties in her family life and in her professional life. And we gave her just a little, little bit of advice about you know, how to practice. And she said it completely transformed everything. You know, in, in such a short time, she couldn't believe it. So I think that for ordinary people with busy lives, what they need is just short periods of practice, not being too ambitious, right? Um, and then, you know, even if our mind becomes calm and clear, just for a few minutes, we, we recognize the potential. And, and that way we gain enthusiasm. And recognizing also that any skill that we wish to accomplish takes time, takes lots of practice, right? I mean, if you want to be a musician or an artist or a dancer or a sports person, we practice, right? You practice and you practice and practice and eventually step by step, we gain confidence that we can accomplish. And with the, that confidence, that belief in our own potential, comes enthusiasm, you know, yes, this I can do. It's not just other people can do it. I also can do. So to start simple, keep the practice simple. Don't make it complicated and just keep going. And then of itself, it begins to generate more and more enthusiasm, more and more belief in our potential to transform. And transformation brings happiness. Okay, thank you. The second question. When I meditate, the mind is often very discursive and uh -huh. easily distracted. Since it is said that the mind is like a muscle and needs to be trained, apart from persevering in meditation so as to train it, do you have any other tips, any tips to improve the practice? Well, I mean, everybody, I'm sure, including the Buddha, because the Buddha knew very much about monkey mind. Everybody starts out with a very distracted mind. We're in the habit of being distracted. So, of course, we're going to be distracted. What do we expect? One of the, 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 uh, the, the points of, of practicing meditation is that so many people think they're in control of their lives. Then they try to sit down and meditate for five minutes on the breath and within a minute or two have recognized that they are not in control even of their own minds what to speak of their whole life and this teaches us some humility perhaps you know because everybody goes through this um so again my feeling is at the beginning to uh keep the sessions fairly short and emphasize this, this development of awareness because that, that's what it's all about. So that if, for example, we are uh, meditating on the breath, watching the breath come in and out, then the emphasis should be mainly on the, um, not so much attention on the object, the breath, but more attention given to the awareness of the breath because that's what we're trying to develop. It's this ability to, to know, to be conscious, to be aware. So the actual object is not so important. What is important is our ability to know it, the object, right? So then when we lose that awareness and we get swept away by our conceptual thinking mind again, no problem. As soon as we notice that we are not on the object, we bring it back again, because even knowing that we have lost the object means that we are aware again. We are aware that we're lost. So no problem. 
right? So then we bring it back again and again, however many times until the mind begins to settle, right? Again, honestly and truthfully, any skill takes time to cultivate it and, and it requires practice. I mean, like anything, you know, don't be impatient, but be persevering, right? So, you know, slowly, slowly at one time, the mind will suddenly settle for a few minutes. And so we recognize that we can do this. It's possible. It's not an impossible task we're setting ourselves. Actually, the mind can settle down. Then next, next session, the mind is more crazy than ever. But it doesn't matter. You know, next session, try again. And next session, try again. Keep the session short with, with the, the, I would say to start by thinking, look, I'm going to give five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however much out of the whole day. This is such a short time. Come on, mind, you know, cooperate, stop messing around, behave yourself. You know, we are breathing, we're going to know we're breathing. We are thinking, we're going to know we're thinking, right? So whatever is the object of our, our just to give ourselves the little push to, to the mind to tell it to, you know, really behave itself and, and try to, to cooperate. And, and to try to, but not to get upset when the mind doesn't cooperate, not to get upset with ourselves, which is another distraction. Relax. All we have to do is sit and breathe, relax, and know we're breathing. That's all we have to do. And however many times we get distracted, just bring the mind back again. The, the only trouble is when we give up and we don't bring the mind back again. As long as we bring the mind back to the, to the object of our, our attention, then that was a good session. Okay, thank you. So the third question is, is there any question you're still trying to answer for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there's not really any particular question, you know, the Dharma covers everything more or less. But there, of course, there are some things like, you know, what happens after death, uh, actually, because everybody has their own version of what's going to be happening. So now, once we die, that answer will only come once we get there, you know. Once we die, then I'll find out the answer to that question. What happens next? Okay, then uh, the fourth question is this, what is a thought? Is there a difference between a spontaneous thought that arises without being aware of it and a thought which we intentionally develop? Okay, so I mean, basically thoughts are just pulsating energies arising in the brain, right? Just like a stream of mental moments one after the other after the other. Thoughts are just thoughts, including the intention to develop a thought. That is also a thought, right? And in order to be free from this tyranny of, of thinking, we need to develop, we need to develop the awareness which allows us to see the space because normally we are trapped in our thinking and we identify with our thinking and we, we think we are our thoughts. And, and this is why awareness is so important. It's the most essential thing as far as developing qualities in, in our mental development. And this is why we start with something simple like the breath, you know, just the breath, the thoughts, sensations, sound, doesn't, the object is not the important thing. The important thing is to begin to get that clarity and that, that space in which we see and we observe without being pulled along. So once we have gotten the ability to be conscious, to be aware of the thoughts, uh, of the breath, then we turn it back onto the thoughts. And again, the idea is to see a thought 
as they flow without being swept along by them. I mean, this is really the most important thing to recognize then because we can see a thought as a thought, it's not me, it's not mine, right? We don't have to identify with, with our, our thinking. And that the thoughts themselves are essentially empty. They're like, you know, like the, a bubble, which is very bright and shiny and looks very solid. But if you prick it, it just is empty. It's, it's not something which is solid, real. And, and in Buddhist parlance, it's not self-existent from its own side. It's just a passing phenomena. And, and this is why we need to be able to observe the thoughts without being swept along by the thoughts, because thoughts are just thoughts. And nothing wrong with thoughts. I mean, it's, it's an incredible um, ability to be able to think. Nothing wrong with thinking. We're not trying to stop the thoughts. What we're trying to do is to be aware of the thoughts and, and not um, immersed in the thoughts, like, you know, being immersed in a river and swept along. Now we're stepping outside of the river and just seeing the river without being the river. And so all the thoughts, including our intentions, are all part of the, the thinking, um, the mental process which is going on in the mind. And so what we need to do is to, to recognize that and, and not be, um, as I say, you know, caught up in thinking this is me and mine. We believe our thoughts, this is our problem. You know, our memories, our ideas, our, our opinions, our prejudices, our beliefs, everything seems so real to us. But once we can observe it, then we can see they're just thought moments, you know, flying by. They're not me and mine. And a thought is just a, a mental impulse. Very useful, but, you know, uh, who is in control? Okay. So the fifth question is as follows. During the time you were in retreat, what scared you the most? If there was something that scared you and what gave you the most support? You know, I, I thought about that. I can't remember being scared of anything. I mean, what was there to be scared of? Um, you know, because uh, Lahul itself was, uh, you know, it's a Buddhist region. And so I didn't feel threatened by people, you know, like in an ordinary situation, a, a woman practicing by themselves, especially in India, is very vulnerable to outside um, interference. But in, in Lahul, that wasn't true because in Lahul, the, all the villagers knew I was up there and they were perfectly happy that that was so. And I didn't feel in any way threatened by them. Right. Um, and what else was there to be scared of? I'm not scared of ghosts. Um, I mean, even when an evil spirit came, I wasn't afraid of it. I just, you know, felt I was, you know, guarded by all the wooden bodhisattvas of the universe, so who are you? You know, compared with that, you know, these naughty little demonic sprites are nothing, you know, they're powerless if you're not afraid of them. You just laugh at them and then they go, Ooh, you know, and, and run off, right? Oh. Um, so I, I can't think that I was really scared of anything, really. It's not a thing which was any problem. But what was very supportive was being in a, a, a region where the Buddha Dharma had been for, you know, millennia. I mean, Lahul got Buddhism before Tibet. And it is also considered to be the land of the Dakinis. And the, this very powerful feminine energy was definitely there. Absolutely, 100%, you could feel it. And that was very, very supportive, their, their energy, because they are always very happy when you're trying to do your practice. And also the local spirits were very happy. They always were very um, helpful whenever you needed them, they were there for you. And the practice itself was the greatest support 
that one had the opportunity to completely immerse oneself in the practice uh, without any external distractions. And far from that, the, the feeling that or the whole of nature and everything was being very supportive and, and rejoicing that one, one was trying to do it at one's best. I mean, it wasn't such a great best, but it was the best I could manage. And everyone was, you could feel that, that all the spirits and all the whole of nature and all the people there, everyone was happy, rejoicing in that. That was very supportive. And the reason why I couldn't think of anywhere better to be, you know, because it was such a, a perfect opportunity to become as much as possible uh, one with, with what one was trying, endeavoring to practice. So, you know, Lahul is a very special place, actually. I mean, most people pass okay. through it when they go on their way to Ladakh or Spiti and they don't even notice it. But actually, it's a very sacred area. Thank you. So next question. If you had to recommend an essential practice for Westerners with a limited daily time on their hands, what would you recommend? Well, you know, mostly I, I advise people to uh, cultivate basic shamatha practice um, based on the awareness, awareness of the breath or awareness of thoughts. Because as one Lama remarked to me, if you have good shamatha, the rest of the Dharma is in the palm of your hands. I mean, everything depends on making our minds supple, pliable, workable right, lesurungwa, and um, able to focus on the object of our, our endeavors. So I, I would say that the first thing is to cultivate awareness through shamatha, right? so that the mind becomes more clear, more calm, and much more focused and attentive. And then the, the mind feels healthy, and, and balanced, right, for, for not just for a sitting practice, but during the day. And then to cultivate the form immeasurables, you know, using, um, you know, loving kindness and compassion and, and joy and this sense of uh, open impartiality towards all beings, it's very important. And as you know, the Buddha recommended that we start by giving these thoughts of loving kindness and compassion and so forth, first to ourselves, because so many people, their, their whole problem is that they are, they're not at peace within themselves, they're in conflict, they don't like themselves, or they, they think they're unworthy, incapable, and so forth. And, and so first we have to make friends with ourselves. You know, it doesn't mean that we sit there thinking, wow, I'm the greatest. But it does mean that we sit there thinking, you're okay, you know, you've got your faults, never mind. But, you know, you're all right and you can do it. So we have to give ourselves a, a sense of encouragement and friendliness and sympathy for the difficulties, but also rejoicing in our goodness. As well as then extending that out, as you know, towards those that we care for, our family and our friends and then those we feel pretty indifferent towards, and then those we find difficulties with, our problem people in our lives, and then to all beings, because all beings wish for happiness and don't want to suffer. But we have to start from where we are. So to encourage ourselves by creating a, a peaceful mind, which is not in conflict with itself. A peaceful mind not in conflict with itself is a peaceful mind not in conflict with others. You know, we can deal with others if we are, can deal with ourselves. And the Buddha always wanted that before we dealt with more analytical uh, practices and started to peel away the layers of the ego. First, we have to have a healthy, balanced sense of self. Otherwise, we can do a lot of injury to ourselves if we try to, you know, um, uh, what's the word, you know, kind of, take apart the ego when the ego is already in pain and suffering. 
we, 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 then you can create a lot of problems. But if the, the sense of self is strong and, and healthy, then it can walk the path towards the dissolution of the self. It's able to do that because it has that inner confidence and belief that it can walk the path. And the path of itself will help towards the um, dissolution of the ego. That's what it's based on through the insight and, and understanding of how the mind works. And then I would say, for because most people don't have much time, that we use our, it's very, very important to use our daily life as our practice. You know, not to think sitting on my cushion is practice, you know, when I'm meditating, reading a Dharma book, going to a Dharma center, listening to Lamas on YouTube, all that is Dharma practice. Then I have to deal with my family. Then I have to deal with my work. Then I have to deal with my neighbors and social conditions. That is worldly activity. Then we feel overwhelmed. We think, well, my, my Dharma practice is so small. Worldly activity is so much. How are we going to deal with this? And so it's very important to recognize that our interrelationship with others and how we approach our, our life and our work and everything, all of that is our Dharma practice. This is the important thing. It's the time, the opportunity to cultivate the paramita, to become more ethical. That's very, very important to lead an ethical life and to be more kind, more compassionate, more generous, more patient with others, and so forth. I mean, to make all our encounters during our life, including very much with the family, as an opportunity for cultivating these, these qualities of the heart. So in that way, our daily life becomes our, our practice. I mean, that this is very, very important. Remembering that everybody that we meet, every being, not just people, but animals, want to be okay. You know, they, they want to feel okay, they don't want to suffer. And so at least to do that for them, you know, to be friendly, to smile, to be polite. Maybe that to compliment them on something they're wearing or what they're looking at to make them feel better, right? So then also lojong. Right, the practice of mind trans transforming our attitudes so that when difficulties come, instead of seeing that as an obstacle, we see it as the opportunity for practice. So, so many things, you know, difficult people, difficult situations, we take the, everything onto the path. That's the point. If we take everything, including very much all our encounters and all our activities, in our daily life as the opportunity for practice, then, you know, we have so much, oh, we have enormous amounts of opportunity to, to transform moment to moment to moment. I mean, even just walking down a corridor or upstairs and being conscious that we are walking is an exercise in mindfulness. Every time we drink a cup of tea or coffee, instead of just drinking and, and talking or, or thinking 10 million things, we can be conscious that we're drinking, right? And, and everything is, is an opportunity. When, when whatever comes in through our sense doors to be notice our responses of pleasure or displeasure and work with that also. Oh, there's endless, endless opportunities to transform our daily life into a Dharma practice. And there's really no excuses not to do that if we're sincere, because the whole point is to transform the mind. Yes, thank you. Then uh, next question. When we speak of the mind as a knower or observer, is that referring to the conventional nature of the mind? That is its clarity and knowing capacity? If so, can this clarity of the mind be experienced by merely calming the mind without going into formal meditation? Well, as I, I said before, the first step, 
the first step is to develop that awareness, right? That can observe the mental stream of thoughts without being ca caught up in it and swept away. I mean, the whole problem is not our thinking, but the fact that we become our thoughts and get swept along by it like a, a stream, you know, a wa water, a river where we're just swept along by all our thoughts and feelings and, and memories and anticipations and opinions and ideas and concepts and blah, 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 the whole time. It's like a television on in the mind, just endlessly and repeat programs, right? It, it's very unoriginal, right? We are always having repeats of the same old program. And so what the first step is to learn how to step out of the river and sit on the banks, observing the river. We're not damming up the river. We're not trying to stop the thoughts. What we're trying to do is to observe the thoughts as thoughts, right? Good thoughts, bad thoughts. So merely being calm does not necessarily give us the awareness that knows the calm. Right? What we are trying to do is develop this, this knowing aspect of the mind, right? the knower. And, and so we should stay aware, even when the mind is turbulent, not just during the calm times. I mean, there are three things here. There is a time when the mind is calm and quiet and rested. There's a time when the mind is, is thinking very, uh, you know, very um, caught up and, and turbulent in this river. Sometimes the river is very calm. Sometimes the river is very turbulent. But there is all should always be that sense of presence of awareness under all circumstances, right? So whether the mind is calm or whether the mind is distracted, there should be the awareness there. That's the important thing, not the calm itself, but the ability to know the calm. Do you understand? Does that make, is that clear? Sure. Because it's, it's this, this ability of knowing, you know, this is the point that, that there, there, there's a knowing and then there's a space within which all these thoughts and come up and they glide by and we just know them, but we're not pulled by them. Right, because we see they're just thoughts. They're not me, they're not mine. They're thinking, some thoughts are very intelligent, some thoughts are very stupid, but they're all thoughts, right? And, and so therefore, the important thing is not so much the thoughts, but the knowing of the thoughts. Okay. Mm? Thank Does that you. that make sense to you, Yes. 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 It makes sense. And the next question, actually, it follows up uh, on the same subject, you see. The next question, it says, you describe the experience of knowing be beyond the known and the knower, an experience that gives meaning to existence and shows the direction to go. How to make this experience emerge again and again and become stable? <laughs> that's the question isn't it? <laughs> yeah that's the question <laughs> so what we were talking about was the primordial non-dual nature of the mind our, our buddha nature right um the unity of emptiness and luminous clarity so usually it is glimpsed just for a very short time you know and then the egoistic, dualistic consciousness takes over and claims the experience. And that's the problem, right? Yeah. So the, it's like if we think of the sky and then, you know, normally it's covered with clouds of our conceptual thinking, dualistic mind, and then the clouds separate. And for a moment, we see the sky and then form the clouds are back again. Right. But the point is that now we know that there is a sky, right? That the clouds just come out of the sky, go back into the sky, but there is more to the sky than just the clouds. This is the important realization 
um, I think in the, in the Pali Canon Theravada, it's called entering the stream. From that point on, you're eventually at some point going to uh, attain to liberation. And in the, um, in the Zen, it's called Kensho, which means again, it's breakthrough to this different level of consciousness, which is non-dual. I mean, normally the problem is that our ordinary conceptual consciousness which is um, mostly activated through the ego, gives us a sense of being separate from others. There's me and then there's everybody else, not me. And the, but the ultimate nature of the mind is that quality of the mind, which interconnects us with everything because everything is conscious. And normally our consciousness is separated from other consciousnesses, but at a very deeper level, it's not. Like the sky, it, it's all pervading, it's everywhere. You can't say where is space not. Space is everywhere. Even solid objects in their ultimate nature are space. And so this is like the, the nature of our mind, which is interconnected with all, all, all beings. And therefore, it's very important that we recognize this is our ultimate nature, not this little me sitting there thinking I'm so important or that I'm so stupid. That's not who I really am. There is something beyond that. When the Buddha said there was no self, he just meant you're not your ego. He didn't mean we don't exist. Of course we exist, but we don't exist how we think we exist. And, and this is the tragedy for us because truly we are essential nature is wisdom and compassion, but we don't know that. And we, we think we're just very limited sentient beings. And, and so therefore, when we get that first glimpse that shows us, ah, there's so much more going on. And so then of course the, um, the practice is to realize that again and again, this fundamental nature and to increase and stabilize its duration. My, my Lama said to me that when you realize the nature of the mind, then you start to meditate. And until then we're kind of practicing, trying to get it right. And then suddenly it opens up and we see, ah, but then it closes again. So yes, it, it's a problem. Of course, the ego mind wants this experience because you know this is incredible wow the ego really wants this experience but it's the very ego mind that obscures it it's that wishing for it that grasping which is the reason why we don't get it again and again so the point is to relax it's very important to relax the mind completely let go and just look and then Again, the clouds unfold. And, and so the whole practice after that is indeed how to gradually begin to stabilize the experience. In our monastery and now in our nunnery, um, we have a number of uh, monks and here nuns who have been in, in retreat for many, many years. In our nunnery, our nuns have done 13 years of retreat and they're carrying on lifelong retreat and in the monastery likewise, in order to train to become what are called topden, which means realized ones. And you don't become a topden, which means you don't become recognized as, as a qualified yogi until the realization of the nature of the mind is completely stabilized. And until it is completely, you can see it the moment you want. You know, like the nature of the mind. Well, there it is, they say. And so you go, yeah, right, okay. I mean, but they've, they've got it there. They can see it anytime and they can be in that state anytime. Then they are regarded as being fully cooked, right? I mean, I, I, I compare it to like, if you're cooking um, a cake, and you put the dough, the, the mixture into the oven, you turn the heat up, and then very quickly the cake will rise. And then we think, oh, the, it's cooked. In other words, you get some experience of the nature of the mind, you think you're enlightened. And so then you take it out the oven, 
but then because the inside is not really fully cooked, it just collapses into this kind of gooey mess. So that's like, you know, people who think they're enlightened just because they've had some special experiences, but it isn't fully cooked. What you need is to keep the, the cake inside the oven until it is cooked all the way through. When it's cooked all the way through, then you take it out of the oven and it's very delicious and nurturing. But if you take it out too soon, then it's almost worse than before you put it in. So it's, this is very important that we just keep practicing and practicing. It's why even the great lamas in Tibet spent so many years in retreat. And, and you think, why did they bother? They were already so enlightened. But they could see that there were still areas that needed to be completely accomplished. And until that was ready, they, they didn't go out and set themselves up as, as teachers. So yes, it takes lifetimes to um, fully stabilize the realization. But the first thing is to get that realization of the nature of this non-dual, primordial, unborn, deathless level of our consciousness, which is our true being, our Buddha nature. And which is always there. That's the really important thing for people to realize. We don't have to cultivate it. It's already there. What we need is to recognize it. It's there. Okay. You know, but we don't see it because we are, we are caught up in our conceptual thinking mind and our dualistic awareness. And we don't know how to drop that to open up into a much deeper, profoundly deeper, level of primordial awareness which we all have which we all possess but we don't know how to look okay thank you Jitsuma. uh next question you probably already answered <laughs> but uh, it is is there any way ordinary beings can perceive ultimate reality <laughs> Well, you know, all beings, ordinary beings, extraordinary beings, we all have Buddha nature. This is the important thing. Our primordial awareness is always there, right? Like the vast, all-encompassing sky. It's obscured by the clouds of our conceptual thinking, which is dualistic. But once we begin to cultivate awareness, then the clouds begin to thin out, right? And then we can recognize that gap between the clouds. We can all do this, right? I mean, ultimately there's no difference between ordinary and extraordinary, right? We are all extraordinary. We just don't know it. This is the point, okay. you know? I mean, there's nobody who can, has a better Buddha nature than somebody else's Buddha nature. I mean, we're all just Buddha nature. I mean, our, our ultimate nature of the mind is exactly the same, whether you're the Dalai Lama or whether you're a peasant working in the field, it doesn't make any difference. And in fact, sometimes a peasant working in the field gains much deeper realizations than some big Lama sitting on his throne. Um, but people don't, you know, because the nature of the mind is the nature of the mind. And whether we recognize it or we don't recognize it um, has nothing to do with, uh, you know, our level of intelligence even. And certainly of our level of, of scholarship, what it depends on is that we know how to look. How to recognize, this is the point, how to recognize the awareness which is always with us. We are always conscious, this is the point, we are always conscious, but we don't recognize that consciousness. So on the one hand, it, it seems like very far, but on the other hand, it's the closest thing in the world. I mean, the, the te traditionally it said it's like the, the eyelashes, they're so close we don't see it. We can see things at a distance, but we can't see things which are, are too close to us. So our, our consciousness, our awareness is always there, but it's so, so close that we don't even see, see it. We don't recognize it. So that's all, is that we just have to recognize what is always there. 
but we, we overlook it because we're looking for something else. Like the sky, okay. like space, right? You, you don't see space. You, you walk into a room and you say to somebody, what was there? And they say, well, there were chairs, there were tables, there were people, there was this, there was that. But really what there is is space. But we don't see the space. But all those chairs and tables couldn't exist if it was not for the space to put them in. And like as when we look at the mind, we keep looking at our thoughts and the feelings and, and, you know, but we don't see that which sees. That's our problem. That's why it's so simple. And yet, because it's so simple, it, it, it's very difficult for us. Okay. Thank you. Next question is also about the same subject. Did the Buddha explain how come, how comes that if the primordial mind is pure, it gets polluted by afflictions? Is this pollution process to be intended as something happening moment by moment until we realize liberation? Well, I mean, you know, who knows? Um... The Dzogchen do have some explanation, but I'm not sure that it's very helpful. Um, but at a certain point, certainly, um, our primordial, pristine primordial mind split into dualistic perception. On the other hand, maybe this is part of our evolution, you know, that we need to, to do this. Time is circular, so there's no beginning and no end, right? So, but the nature of the mind is unborn and deathless. So one, once the consciousness becomes dualistic, then we, we have this, this concept of an ego, right? I, I am separate from others, right? That, that's the split and it arises along with the sense of uh, attraction to what is pleasant and aversion to what is unpleasant, right? So then the ego grasps at the actions of our body, speech, and mind, and then karma is uh, created. And then the whole cycle of samsara goes around. I mean, karma is there because the ego claims the actions of body, speech, and mind. I did this, right? And because we believe in a, a doer, therefore the, the whole cycle of, of karma and results comes into being. And the, the way to go beyond karma, of course, is to dissolve the ego and realize there was no actor behind the action. So I think that it's part of our, our evolution and our development that there has to be this period of separation and then the ultimate union on an ultimate level we have never been separate it's part of our delusion it's part of the dream of samsara i mean the the, the word for for getting enlightened means to wake up right the word good is is to wake and so on one level this is all a dream and we're all sleepwalking. And what we need is to wake up. When we wake up, we recognize that from the very beginning, this was never a problem. But in the meantime, you know, we dream and we might have nice dreams or nightmares, but we think it's real. So that's what we have to wake up from, you know. I mean, when we wake up in the morning, we think now I'm awake, but from a, you know, a spiritual point of view, we're still asleep. Okay. So on one level, the, that, 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 you know, there never was a split. It's only um, our delusion which thinks that. Because Buddha nature is always there. It's not gone away somewhere. And it's never polluted. This is very, very important for people to realize that no matter what we do and however base our actions may be, they never, ever, ever, ever can pollute the nature of the mind. Okay. Thank you, Jetsuma. 
So now we have the last two questions. In the chapter on, in the wisdom chapter of the Bodhisattva Charyavatara, we read, it has been said by the protector of the world himself that the mind does not have the ability to behold the mind. Just as the blade of the sword cannot cut itself, likewise the mind cannot behold itself. Then what can we, what we can perceive then are only reflection or products of our mind, such as thoughts and emotions. So yeah, we can observe thoughts and emotions with awareness, right? And that awareness then that awareness itself, right, transcends itself into primordial awareness, which is non-dual. So in that way, it does not perceive itself. It, it, it is non-dual. The non-dualistic level of the mind is what we've been talking about, right? So this means there's no subject and object, but the two become one. So this interconnects us with everything rather than creating this sense of separation. So in that way, the ultimate, when they're talking about mind here, they mean the ultimate nature of the mind, that we cannot perceive it as something outside of ourselves. When we, are, when we recognize the nature of the mind, we are the nature of the mind. So there is no split between the two. It's only when we're in a dualistic conceptual thinking mind that there seems to be a dualism of observer and observed. But when we see the fundamental nature of the mind, then the, that's when the subject and object become one. So in that way, you could say we, you cannot observe the mind because you become the mind. Right. OK. Then uh, the last question. <laughs> the reasoning of an eye that is not my body or my mind but only a mental projection is understandable to me. But when I think of the mind observing the mind, the idea arises that scrutinizing mind could be the mental continuum that I carried for a time without beginning. And this creates the feeling of I. How to eradicate this erroneous reasoning? Oh, how we think and think and think ourselves into knots, isn't it? Um, so yes, we do need to observe the mind, meaning the mental continuum, right? That's the mental stream of thoughts and feelings in order to recognize that we are not the thoughts and feelings. Because the whole problem is we identify with our conceptual thinking mind. We think this is who I am, my, idea, my memories, my opinions, my judgments, my likes, my dislikes, my aspirations, my personality, all of that is me, right? And, and so that's our delusion, right? That's right from the start. So the only way to overcome that is to see that we are not the, the conceptual thinking mind. We have a conceptual thinking mind, which is useful, but that is, we are so much more than that, right? So we first we cultivate the awareness that observes the thoughts, but as we do that, as we do that, as we begin, as our awareness grows stronger in observing the thoughts, so the stream of thoughts gets slower. We don't have to slow down the thoughts of themselves as our awareness grows stronger, the thoughts will naturally become slower. And then if we are really focusing and really in a very relaxed manner, observing the thoughts, then we see the, the space between the thoughts, there's a gap between the past thought and the future thought, because they've kind of wound down and they're slower. And then we see that space between, and that space between itself is the nature of the mind. And we recognize that all our thoughts and feelings arise from space, and there is a space in the mind. It's not all close and, and tight, right? So then, then when our awareness is very clear and our, our thoughts have gone 
slower, then we can drop the thoughts and just be aware of being aware. Normally, when we are practicing mindfulness or awareness, there is a subject that is aware and the object of the awareness, the breath, the sensations, the thoughts, sound, whatever. So there, there is that duality there. Now we are dropping the object, whatever the object might be, which is just like um, a tool for the, the, to develop our, our focus, to develop our awareness. We drop that, that object and we are simply aware of being aware. We are aware of that awareness. That, that's the point, right? So when we look into the nature of the awareness itself, then we begin to recognize primordial awareness, which underlies it and which is the empty clarity of wisdom and compassion, right? So it's like, again, observing the sky behind the clouds. It's like when, you, when, you, uh, when we, we practice being aware, being aware, I mean, it might not last for very long, but it's really like, like an eagle flying in the sky, you know, very vast, open. It's not making any effort. A, a little sparrow, you know, trying to fly, flaps its wings like crazy to keep itself up. But a, a large bird like a hawk or an eagle, they just spread their wings and are kept up by the current. They're completely effortless. But they are totally, totally alert and focused and awake they're not sleeping right their their minds are completely sharp and they know exactly where they are and what they're doing but it's absolutely effortless that is the the, the kind of mind which we need to cultivate which has this open space that birds can see for miles and miles around very very precisely they're they're sight is it's so much greater than ours and they're completely present with what is happening in that moment that's what we have to cultivate that open spacious relaxed effortless quality of knowing under all circumstances then naturally insight clarity and tremendous compassion arises because we see how much all these beings suffer because of our attachment to the sense of me and mine and our belief in our conceptual thinking mind as the ultimate knowledge. And because of that, we create so much suffering for ourselves, so much suffering for other beings. We are dominated by negative emotions, our greed and aversion and our pride and just our ego. Our ego is in charge and our ego is so ignorant. How sad, how sad when we have this great Buddha potential within us, which is always there waiting for us to recognize it. I think the good thing is that the Buddha is always smiling. When you look at all the, you know, the paintings of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, despite all this and their tremendous compassion, nonetheless, they're smiling at us and saying that behind all these dark clouds, the vast blue sky is waiting. Don't give up yet. It's okay. In the end, it will be okay. So that's it, you know, develop, start by developing just, you know, the ability to be present, to sense that sense of spacious inner presence as much as possible under all circumstances. During the day when we have a few minutes or when we're getting frazzled, bring the attention back to the breath, breathing in, breathing out, just relaxing, not tensing up, just allowing the mind to just settle and, and the heart to open, recognizing that we are all trapped in this prison of samsara, but that we have the, the key to get out, which is incredible. And back to enthusiasm, how fantastic that we have met with the Dharma in this lifetime.
And that gives us the key to open the door of samsara, not just for ourselves, but for all the other prisoners who are likewise entrapped. Well, we open the door wide and say, come on, quick, guys, get out. That's beautiful. Yes, thank you so much, Jatsuma, for your time. We enjoy, uh, and you know, your teaching really made an impact on our minds. So now we would like to offer you a prayer with our heart. I read it in English. The foremost mother of all Buddhas, branch of the Vajra Varai, swift and noble accomplisher marked with wish-fulfilling wills, which is why Tara, she who bestows abundance, the deathless Ushnisha Vijaya, and all the supreme long life deities bestow virtues and goodness. You are a field of perfectly pure morality, laden with bountiful fruits of hearing, contemplating, and meditating, who run, uh, wondrously uh, brings forth happiness for all in the three worlds. Please remain forever as, as a spiritual friend at the heart of the practice lineage. Utterly stainless and noble vase of sacred lineage teachings, holding the pith of Rechumba's lineage of oral instructions. You who heals the weaknesses in the teachings and in beings, Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo, may your lotus feet firmly remain. By the blessings of the infallible truth of the three jewels, Duzulamo, the five Serima sisters, and others, and by the ocean of activities of the Samaya bound Dharma Palace, may the unfolding of your excellent deeds shine in the ten directions. May the great nunnery of the ultimate lineage, Dongyo Gatsa Ling, a deep wellspring of the study and practice of Sutra and Tantra, flourish as long as the sky remains as a sacred tree of offering for sentient beings throughout the three worlds. <laughs> yes, like, Tibetans do tend to go on a bit. <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you, Massimo. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, we hope you can come back again to shed a light on our practice like you did today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Dear. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And Thank good you. luck to all. Thank the translators. Really, without the translators, there is nothing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and to all of those who are part of your center, also may your dharma flourish. But please use your daily life as your practice also. You know, this is so important to realize that daily life is your practice. This is it, really, you know. And that transforms everything, including your family, your workplace, your, your social relationships, everything which happens take it on the path and then everything is meaningful right there is no waste of time thank you thank you thank you thank you sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you